Welcome back. My name is Gary and I'm making a short uh, series of YouTube videos to help people perhaps uh, achieve a higher likelihood of success with uh, astrophotography. This is the uh, second of the series. Um, it's background information. Um, a lot of people don't really quite fully understand calibration frames. In fact, you might not even know what they are. I'm going to assume the middle ground that you have some knowledge about them and we're going to actually have a look at some and stretch them and talk about what they do. Uh, look at the math of calibration frames and also um, provide some guidance on how many to take. So what are calibration frames? When you take a picture you're taking a light frame. This is your image frame. With astrophotography, we take long exposures to get collect more light, and we take many exposures. And the more you take, uh, the more it counts, cancels out the noise in the background. There are limits to that. I'll be discussing that shortly as well. But there are other types of noise. Um, the four types or three types of calibration frames for DSLR shooters. It's a little different if you're using a dedicated astro camera. But for us, it's, uh, you take dark frames, uh, bias frames, and flat frames. Now, a dark frame takes care of something that happens when the sensor in the camera gets hot. Uh, when you do one, two, three minute long exposures, there's some heat generated. So some of the uh, pixels just pop and go full white. We call them hot pixels. And um, if, if you take dark frames during or after your imaging session, um, those pixels will still be popped, so the uh, software can take them into account and get rid of them. Now, ever since I got my tracker, it's been below freezing outside, so I tried a couple of sets with dark frames, and they did very little for me, no hot pixels. So I haven't been doing dark since then. Come spring, when we start shooting above freezing again, then it probably uh, will be something that I'll have to look at. But the problem with darks is that they have to be taken under exactly the same circumstances as your main image pictures. So if you're shooting one minute images, then the darks also have to be one minute long at the same ISO. The only difference is that you put the lens cap on. That's why they call them darks. There's no light. It's only detecting the hot pixels. So if you're the type of person that wants uh, 16 to 25 calibration frames and I'll go into the numbers a little bit more later but uh, when you're talking about darks you're starting to take up a bit a fair bit of your in imaging time and uh, for me there's no benefits so I don't uh, not so far anyways but uh, it's it's something to be aware of the second kind of noise we have to deal with is taken care of by bias frames. Now the way you shoot a bias frame is at the lens cap on at the maximum, the fastest shutter speed your camera can do. In my case, that's one eight thousandth of a second. Um, aperture doesn't matter. There's no light. And ISO lockdown um, at the same level as the light frames that you've shot. And so you shoot a bunch of those. They're quick and easy. And well, let's have a look at some bias frames. I'm just going to go over to a desktop view now. Sorry. And I'm going to use a program called Cyril to, to look at these frames. Um, so we'll be getting to know Cyril in the next video. This is kind of a key part of this whole presentation to take people a level above where they are right now. But for now, we're just using it to view something. So in this case, we're going to look at a, at a bias frame. It uh, is a result of com combining 16 bias frames on a prior run. You don't need to shoot new biases for every time you generate new images. So on a prior run, I took the uh, stacked one and saved it off, and I reuse it. So here it is. So let's just open that up. No, not much there. But uh, at the same time, it's one eight thousand second with the lens cap on and so on. So let's stretch it out and have a closer look. So what this is really revealing is pure 
sensor pattern noise. Um, if you zoom in on it, it, it's random noise, but that's, that's endemic to the sensor. There's a little bit of banding there. People often talk about amp glow in their images. Well, down at the bottom here, that's part of bias. Uh, if you're getting amp glow, chances are if you get a, a set of bias frames, it can help with that. So the last uh, calibration frame I want to talk about is flats, and this is arguably, to me, the most important one. These ones are shot um, with the ISO locked down at the same um, settings you use for taking your light images. The, you put the camera in aperture priority mode, so the only thing left for the camera to control is the shutter speed. And then you want to put it a in front of some flat light. A lot of people suggest stretching a towel over and uh, uh, fastening it with an elastic band, pointing it at the morning sun to get a truly flat light source. For telescope people, that's probably appropriate, but for, for DSLR, DSLR people, it's, it's really quite a bit easier than that. The one thing you need to do is make sure that the image train is the same as it was before. Um, Here's my camera, just as it came off the tripod, tripod last time I used it. I'm going to have to clean my lens. That lens cap wasn't on quite right. It was cold out. But anyways, to, to shoot a, a flat frame, you're going to put it in aperture priority, lock down the ISO at the same as your imaging session, and now the, con the camera is controlling shutter speed only. Now what I do is open up a white screen on the computer. Um, that's pretty flat and pretty white. I just open a notepad window or something like that. Darken the room. You don't want extraneous light getting in the edges or it'll create uh, false vignetting, for instance. And uh, you need the focus to be the same. So if it's daytime, I'll take it outside and focus on something at least a mile and a half away or two kilometers away. Uh, that's where this lens falls into infinite focus. Um, if it's night outside, I can take a batten off mask and focus it the same way I did when I was shooting. So either way, you want the same focus, the same aperture setting. And then to shoot your flats, all you need to do is get in front of that white screen. And the camera needs to be moving. Just sweep, shoot, sweep, shoot, sweep, shoot. If you're not moving the camera, you'll actually pick up the bear pattern in the, in the computer screen. So that's no good. But if you're sweeping as you go, you actually get a pretty nice um, flat light exposure. So let's have a look at a flat frame. And so that is in my folder called flats here. Now in this case, I've got a pre-processed stacked flat. That means on a prior run, it got pre-processed by subtracting the bias out and then stacked. So let's have a look at that one. Now this one, if you had a histogram view, is uh, right in the middle of the histogram. It's just flat light, and again, this doesn't reveal very much. If we go to an auto stretch view, you start to see at the corners a little bit of the vignetting that it's concealing in there. And if we go to a full-blown stretch, you see what the flat does. Um, the corners are darker. This is called vignetting. It's because the image plane of the lens doesn't quite land exactly where it should on the on the uh, camera sensor, and all these little spots, those are dust spots in or on the lens. Now I keep the front and back very clean. I don't change the lens very often, so I believe that these dust spots are internal. It's a 40 plus year old lens. I bought it because it's very light, but also very high quality glass. And uh, on these trackers, weight, weight matters. But uh, I can't do anything about these spots. So they're internal, and so what I do is I save this flat and I use it. Now if I start seeing spots like that on any images I'm processing, it means I've picked up a new dust spot, and I either have to clean everything or um, take more flats and update this stacked flat uh, image. So that's an idea what they look like. Now let's look at the, uh, the math of uh, calibration images. 
Now, in a, where you've got the full set of calibration images, it's lights minus darks on the top of this equation. And so that takes out those hot pixels, and they both have bias, so lights minus darks also subtracts the bias out of that line. Then you divide that by flat minus bias. And you saw earlier I had that pre-processed flat. That was flat minus bias. So for me, it's just lights minus darks over flats. It's very simple math. The stacking software kind of does all that stuff automatically. But it, it's helpful to kind of understand what it is. Now, I mentioned earlier I don't take dark frames in the wintertime. So all of a sudden, the math changes. And if you want to do it right, the formula is light minus bias divided by flat minus bias. And uh, that works very well for me. I have had no issues with vignetting or spotting or anything else. Um, and it's something that is well worth doing because to deal with those things after the fact, after you've stretched, is difficult. It's much, much better to take care of such things uh, while you, well, after you've shot, but with, uh, with these calibration frames. You know, the last question is, how many do I take? And there's going to be a lot of opinions on this. With your light frames and all your calibration frames, the more you take, the better. But it's not a linear re relationship. It's actually a, a relationship based on a square root. So if you took four calibration frames, take the square root as two, at that point, that calibration done frame has done half of what 10,000 of them can do. And if you graph the curve, it kind of looks like this. So the first ones you take are the most important. Then it starts to level off, and you get out here, and you're getting very, very little extra benefit from more frames. So I kind of was working around 16 which is doing 75% of what a, bio, a calibration frame can do. I'm actually going to reshoot those uh, calibration frames. I'm, I'm going to take it up to, uh, up to 25, which is doing 80% of what they can do. Um, they're easy to take. It could go further, but I'm, I'm shooting with a DSLR on an unguided uh, tracking mount. So things aren't perfect. I, in my view, 80% uh, is pretty good. Now, in the case of light frames, that's a little bit different story. The more light that you can collect, the better. Um, on some of the fainter things I've been doing, I want 90 minutes of exposure. Um, so going from 60 minutes, where I've accomplished 80% of what I can do, up to about 90 minutes, where I've accomplished 89% of what I can do, Mathematically, it's not that big a difference, but when you're dealing with signal over noise, that's some extra signal and less noise. So brighter targets like Andromeda, um, I'm finding 40 minutes is pretty good. 60 would be better. Super bright targets um, like the Orion Nebula. Of course, it's high dynamic range target, but uh, it is very bright. Um, probably somewhere in the vicinity of 20 to 30 minutes. And of course, the length of your subs come into play. I've been shooting 60 seconds. Uh, so one 60 second sub is worth more than two 30 second subs. So that's all stuff to take into your, into your consideration. So the main point here is people have opinions about these things. I just wanted to point out that it flattens. It flattens and you have to make choices about how close to perfection you want to come. You could go up to 120 frames and you're 91% of what they can do. Um, at 100 frames, you are at 90% of what they can do. So is it worth taking that extra 20 frames? I guess that's up to you. But I wanted to make, uh, make you at least a little bit aware of those things. Okay, so we've talked about calibration frames. To me, that is very important um, to accomplishing what you want to accomplish. And this series of videos is designed to get the beginner intermediate person to a successful point. 
Uh, the image beside me here is the North American Nebula. Um, that's the one we're working on in this project. It's not the easiest one. Um, I shot f4 on an f4 lens. Um, so the stars are kind of chromatically aberrated. But I was going for the maximum amount of light possible. I also shot at ISO 800, which is a little beyond the optimal range for my camera. Um, but again, going for maximum light. If I was going to reshoot this again, I'd back it down to ISO 400 and f5.6 and maybe take extra frames. Uh, this is almost 90 60 second subs here. Um, might go for 120 if I had the uh, the other settings, but the other settings would yield a better quality in the end. So this is the second video. The third one is about getting familiar with Cyril. Um, I use Cyril. It's kind of a necessary step on this trip for the pre-processing of your stacked images. But there is really not a lot in terms of good um, tutorials on the use of this of Suro and its interface and using it wisely. So I'm going to do two videos on Suro, one about the interface and scripting and how to write scripts and, and amend scripts. And then the second one will be we'll run through an actual stacking session with it so that if you decide that Suro, if you're going to do the pre-processing there and you decide to do the stacking, you won't be afraid of it. So thank you for visiting, and we will talk to you again very shortly.